Welcome aboard the Shipshape Podcast, your ultimate destination for marine wisdom and expertise. Our skilled crew, comprised of top boating journalists and experts, is committed to delivering informative and captivating content week after week. We're eager to connect with and learn from our fellow mariners, and we encourage you to share our podcast with your friends. Remember, word of mouth is our lifeblood, and if you enjoy an episode, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. By doing so, you're helping us forge a robust community of mariners who can learn, collaborate, and exchange their experiences out on the water. Today on the Shipshape Podcast, we are talking with Vitsa van der Werf, CEO and founder of Sea Ranger Service, working to restore oceans through social impact. Your two co-hosts today are Meryl Shrett, I'm a live aboard on a Tashing Toshiba 36 in Boston, Massachusetts, and T. Hey guys, Talab Hutti here. I'm aboard my Lures 40 in Virginia, and we have a really great guest on today. We're going to learn a lot of cool things about the environment and entrepreneurship, and let's see where this goes. Welcome to the show. So, Vitsa, where are you recording this from? I'm currently based out of London, so uh, I'm very much uh, landlocked uh, <laughs> where I am right now. So you clearly have an exciting legacy within Marine, but how did you start there? Do you grow up boating or, or what's the story? No, so actually my family, all the way dating back to the 15th century, were mostly captains and uh, shipbuilders back in Friesland in the north of the Netherlands. And then sort of two generations back, that legacy ended. And, you know, the family went to do all sorts of other things. So my last name, from the wharf, is what it literally means. <laughs> you know, it does mean that there's that there, that family, <laughs> family history. I actually was a woodworker. So I worked for many years uh, in woodworking and had the opportunity to become a ship's carpenter on a vessel going to Antarctica. And wow. when I was on the ship working for about nine months, this was in a port in Australia, they essentially said, oh, you know, we're actually missing an engineer. We could train you as the sixth engineer, which basically means you are the lowest of the lowest rank doing the night shift, cleaning the oil from the bilge and such. And uh, yeah, and actually I thought, you know, if this is an opportunity to go to Antarctica, that's amazing. And I ended up spending a number of years um, yeah, sailing the Southern Ocean, quite a heavy sort of sea to start off with, uh, to mm. gain your sort of sea legs. But of course, incredible. You're in a, on the one hand, just beautiful and amazing environment, but of course, a very unforgiving sea at the same time. And how old were you when you were uh, doing this in the beginning? Yeah, so I was 22, 23, around, uh, yeah, early teens, early 20s. Yeah, and then sort of stuck on the ship, stayed on that ship for at least five years. So uh, yeah, I got the sea bug pretty early on. Wow. Okay. So you got your sea legs there. And by this point, at the end of five years, like you started, like you said, on the lowest rung, how high had you climbed in those five years? What was your end final <laughs> position? Just about made it to third engineer. <laughs> so I was responsible nice. for one of the watches, but okay. still doing the 12 to 4. So still doing the midnight watch. But yeah, I loved it. At that time, I think it was also uh, every time we would go to Antarctica, every time we would go south, every season we'd meet the ice sooner. So this kind of notion of the effects that climate change and, and the kind of impacts of human activity have on the environment and, and such, I, I would just witness it for myself. And at the same time, we were in all these protected areas, sort of marine protected zones, and it would just be illegal fishing. But, you know, who's going to control the Southern Ocean? It's huge. You know, there's no one there. There, there isn't really any physical way to properly monitor or enforce that. So it was sort of this realization, having worked on the ship, thinking, wow, you know, we really have to do something. And you could almost say the strange notion is that actually a lot of the laws and regulations are already there. It's just a question of how do we implement them properly. In fact, I don't really see we have to, you know, we should be campaigning for more and more protection if we can't even properly protect what already should be protected. So that sort of led me on this whole journey of how can we actually work directly with governments to actually manage oceans better. But it all started uh, as a young man going out to sea and just uh, being in awe of what I could see around me. And so that's what led you to found the Blackfish? Correct. Yeah. So the Blackfish was essentially uh, an organization that we started with some of the shipmates I was actually on the ship with, where we assisted a number of Coast Guard agencies in investigating illegal fishing. And this was really some of the most severe examples and we're talking drift net fishing, which is totally illegal, where you just span a net over tens of miles, which catches everything in its path, even up to shark finning and dynamite fishing, 
literally throwing dynamite and coral reefs just to get you know the fish to float dead up to the surface in order to fish them. Of course, one of the most destructive ways of fishing. And it was a similar situation. There are rules, there's regulations, but there's very little enforcement simply because the agencies lack the staff capacity or the, the budgets to really properly implement and, and enforce the rules. So there, where as an international community, we agree to protect the ocean, it doesn't necessarily mean it is being protected. There's still a bit of a, another puzzle piece, which is about how do you, how do you effectively implement? Is each country sort of responsible for like how many miles outside their border they're responsible for? And then what happens in like this giant, for example, the Atlantic Ocean, that chunk in the middle, what happens there? Yeah, so, of course, there are the territorial limits, which is often a territorial zone is 12 miles out. Then you have, uh, depending on what area you are, could be a 200, 220 kilometer exclusive zone, the economic exclusion zone, where countries and governments have certain responsibilities. But on the high seas, this becomes a problem. So you have what's known as the RFMOs, the Regional Fisheries Management Organizations. But, you know, I'm sure you appreciate that's just a bit of a talking shop for all of the different representatives of government to come together. And, you know, there's not an international navy. There's no UN peacekeeping force out in the oceans, right? That doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. There isn't even some kind of international navy focused on protection of oceans because it becomes everyone's responsibility. Therefore, no one really necessarily takes responsibility. And that's, you could say, the tragedy of the commons, as they also say is the fact that Mm -hmm. this global commons is just out there. In that sense, it's pretty much left as a lawless ocean. You said they're ruled. What do these rules look like? And what would they apply to the high seas, I imagine? Yeah, so these could be all kinds of rules. I mean, not necessarily about fishing. It's also about the various legislation around waste dumping at sea. You know, cargo ships can't just suddenly dump their waste overboard. There's different rules for if you come closer to the coast, where, for example, the grey water coming out of your kitchens on big cargo ships, or I think there's still quite a few scenarios where even the big cruise ships, where they used to actually process photos and chemicals for photo processing, would just go overboard. I mean, the, the list is long. Some of the legislation is good, but of course, it's always a question of enforcement. How do you ultimately enforce the law? And that is ultimately a combination always of calling upon the moral responsibility of your citizens or your users. There's an element of self-regulation of the industry. And then there is an element of sort of the really bad actors that you just have to go out and patrol and, and try and catch them. Unfortunately, when there is such little incentive, or you could say there's a lot of incentive to break the rules because there isn't any monitoring at all. Then, of course, you're not just talking about a few bad actors. You're talking about just widespread kind of (laughs) non-compliance. And that becomes a big big problem. Everyone's a pirate. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, and and that would be funny if the ocean was sort of an endless resource, right? However, as we know, that isn't the case. And, of course, as we've seen with a lot of different fisheries over the years, at some point, fisheries just break down. And then, actually, fishing communities like can lose their livelihoods over, overnight. So even for the benefit of those communities that really rely on fishing and on the ocean as their main source of income or food, we owe it to them to really you know, manage this uh, responsibly. And when you talk about these illegal fishing, is it confined to specific countries? Are some countries more perpetrators than others? Or is this a common theme throughout the world? It is a common theme throughout the world. And I would say that the last few years, huge gains have been made in terms of agreements, in terms of better protection, in terms of more resources that are out there. Satellite data has done a lot to actually increase what they call the maritime domain awareness. So actually for governments to really see what's happening in terms of vessel movements and vessel concentration. So there is a lot of good things are happening. But sort of what essentially spurred me on initially to start this work was really the question of how can we be more clever about this? How can we protect this ocean better with the rules that are already there? And that's where Sea Ranger Service was born. Yeah, indeed. Mm. So one thing that always struck me when we would go to these coastal areas, we would be doing this undercover investigative work and we would be in fishing markets, we'd be in fishing ports. And and the underlying reason why a lot of this illegal activity was happening is just that there's very few opportunities for those people working and living in these coastal areas. It's just a lot of poverty. So is there something we can do to actually bring new opportunities? But it's very hard because there is, you know, many of these areas are very rural. There is actually very few, very few job prospects. At the same time, I'm thinking there is capacity needed to actually better manage the oceans. Could these two problems, in, in a way, access each other's solution? And then I was in the U.S., I was in Michigan at one of the national parks there, and there was like this sort of little hut, kind of like a visitor center before you get into this national park, and there was a little sort of exhibition piece, like a little board. And this one bit was sort of tucked in the corner a little bit, and it caught my eye, and it, it spoke of the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was one of the mm. work programs that President Roosevelt, FDR, 
established in 1933, essentially mobilizing young unemployed men from the inner cities that are unemployed. And under the guidance of the army, they would restore landscape. And in a period of nine years, this civilian conservation corps managed to mobilize three million unemployed men. They established over 800 of the national parks still in use today in the U.S. And they restored huge swaths of landscape. They tackled riverbed erosion. They uh, dug trenches and such to um, like tackle wildfires. They planted over three billion trees and it transformed the U.S. landscape. But at the same time, it offered evening classes and there was all kind of additional training. And many of these young men growing up in quite squalid kind of environments, you know, during the Great Depression suddenly found themselves being out in nature. They would be more healthy. They'd learn. So suddenly their social, their, their social economic prospects would hugely increase. And I'm thinking, wow, this is an amazing legacy, actually. And there's a whole generation of young men in the U.S. back then who yeah, have a lot to thank for. And could we potentially translate this into a modern day maritime setting? So what we essentially did is, and with me, I mean, me and a group of friends initially thought about, could we potentially set up the sea ranger as a new profession? The idea that it's sort of an introductory seafaring role where you are trained and employed and you gain work experience. And we then get you fully qualified as a seafarer that after one year, you then move on to other employers. So could this be a way that we employ veterans to train young people as sea rangers? And then we essentially prepare them as young talent for maritime industry. But while we're training them, we actually help governments to monitor and restore the ocean. And initially, everyone sort of looked at that and thought, well, that sounds all a bit too good to be true. And you know, mm. choose one thing, like have core focus. You can't do it all at once. Yeah. Now, fast forward to five, six years, and we've serviced 13 government contracts. We have had over 120 young people go through our programs. And we're now replicating this to other countries as it's very successful. So... It's been a remarkable few years to actually see the moment you can protect nature, but you can also create the jobs that come with that and its social economic impact. Politically and financially, you're having a very different conversation and you can really get the investment you need to make really long lasting impact. Tell us more about it, though. What is what is like Sea Rangers and the, the government interaction and like the funds? Like what, what do you guys do? Like even like a sort of micro, like you said, rural level, like how does it change people's sure. lives? So the young people that we work with um, essentially could lack certain job prospects. It might They might not have finished high school. There might be other reasons why they're sort of, you could say, have a distance to the labor markets. And when they initially apply with us, they go through a boot camp. So it's entirely run by veterans from the Navy. We have a number of former Marines. There's a lot of structure, discipline. And that's essentially necessary to see, you know, can you hack it being out at sea for two weeks nice. at a time because you're on shifts for two weeks. You're with a small crew. And like we use special sailing vessels and we operate throughout the year, which means even on the North Sea in winter, which is one of the windiest places on earth, we operate and we work out at sea. So for young people, this is on the one hand, it is about personal development. It's about pushing your boundaries. It's about, yeah, really learning to work as part of a team. So the team building kind of aspect of it, as I'm sure you're aware, the moment you're on a ship and, and you're up against it, this is when you are very much confronted with yourself and it just changes people. It changes people for life. The big difference is. This isn't just a charity or a non-profit. We are ultimately contracted by governments to supply our ship for offshore services. So our sea rangers on a day-to-day -day basis, they may take water samples for water quality. They could fly drones to actually inspect cargo shipping for potential pollution. We also have some historic shipwrecks where we actually monitor that people aren't illegally salvaging items from these protected wrecks. We manage marine protected areas where we monitor areas for the government. And government pays us, which means we generate enough revenue that actually it's now financed by two banks who actually are able to really bring in the capital for us to further scale and the impact of our work. And that's really unique because, of course, typically ocean conservation isn't really, there's no business case, there's no market to speak of. But I think we realize that, you know, we can't just leave the protection of the ocean to kind of charity. It can't be a charitable endeavor. It should be the core business of the people that are involved in also benefiting from a healthy ocean economy, that we properly manage it and protect it. So, yeah, it's been really uh, interesting. Also, because initially, of course, governments <laughs> thought we were very sympathetic, you know, young people mm. on the boat doing something for nature. But they, mm. they didn't initially, of course, they had to really get used to the idea that it could also really make a structural uh, difference to really support their own operation as well. So going back before Sea Rangers is this big thing that everyone knows about, what was that entrepreneurial journey like? You had a bunch of friends on a boat. You're like, okay, let's start this thing. There's obviously a need. Now what? How'd you get to where you are? It's really interesting because I think people 
like in people's heads, people like thinking in boxes, right? There's always, uh, <laughs> you know, people like to see that there is either it's environmental or it's social. So every funder or investor we'd meet, that's what they say. One would say, no, I, I love the environmental stuff, but it's really a social project, isn't it? It's really about the social impact. And the next investor would be like, no, I'm sure the social stuff, I, I believe that, but it's really an environmental impact, isn't it? So what we <laughs> sort of, yeah, but it's really interesting. People don't really see these two coming together. Whereas, of course, that is, of course, the beauty of it. And that's actually, you know, the whole promise of working towards a more sustainable future is that this whole kind of energy and climate transition, that it's a, it's a social transition as well, that you know, we bring those jobs to communities where they're needed most, that you can work in these former industrial areas, that you can work in former mining communities, fishing communities, and that's where you create those jobs. So when we started talking about this early on, you could see that it changed the narrative because I was not trying to convince someone about the need to protect our oceans. I was talking about jobs and supporting veterans and bringing kind of social economic impact into these areas. So suddenly more you could say more conservative politicians would get on board. Suddenly a port authority could get on board or the Navy could get on board. So suddenly you had these very unlikely partners that normally would not really be so much interested on the on the ocean kind of conservation side who would suddenly give their backing and say, actually, you're doing something for young people. And I'll give you one example. We had a young person who came to our boot camp, actually been sitting at home for a number of years, didn't finish high school. He smoked quite a bit. And at the same time, he had a gaming addiction, quite severe gaming addiction. Anyway, we, we met with his parents. He, he went into these boot camps, like sort of 10 day boot camp, and he did okay in the boot camp. And we kind of thought like, well, you know, you would benefit most from the program. So we ended up selecting him as a full time sea ranger and he loved the sailing and, and it went, it went well, but it really went well the moment we started draining drone pilots because the moment we trained the <laughs> drone pilots, suddenly he was so good on his controls. <laughs> now this sort of notion, how you work with young people and how you can turn someone's problem or you know disability or whatever you want to call it into a strength that's mm, addiction a into thing. a strength yeah 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 from wow. addiction to conservation and it's yeah. you know and i don't whether it's an investor or it's the european commissioner coming to our ship or a government minister i don't have to really explain anything you meet the young mm. sea rangers you see the pride and identity they take from being in that sea ranger outfit like that uniform and and it's a human centered story it's a human interest story that ultimately sure it makes impact on the ground and you know, we, we, we are now increasingly re- involved in restoring seagrass and help aiding with the surveillance at sea and all of that. But it's about the people. And I think that's sometimes in the environmental movement what we lose. It's often very, you know, it's facts and figures. It's quite an abstract notion of science and all of that. And actually, you'd, unfortunately, you don't really convince people in a broader sense. You don't really inspire them with scientific facts, I don't believe. It's really a story that they can potentially see themselves in and they can recognize. Yeah, it's been interesting in the early stages. To change the narrative. Tell us more about it, the story, the entrepreneurial five years. Tell us more about that. Yeah. So then essentially, we started talking with the government in the Netherlands. And it was a conscious decision to move back to the Netherlands because I'd lived in the UK for many years. And I realized the Netherlands, it's a small country. This is a small government. You can have a foot in the door and start a conversation. And it took just over one year where we met with the government. And at some point, we thought, you know what? We're still waiting on that first government contract. We're just going to start. We're just going to rent a ship. We're going to train sea rangers. And one day, a civil servant calls us and she says, literally, well, you're training sea rangers and there's a ship now and the minister doesn't want to be left behind. (laughs) And the really powerful thing was that, and this is back in 2018, uh, we very much pushed to say this isn't just environmental or social, it's a combination. So typically in government, you have these silos, right? The economic kind of affairs people don't really necessarily talk with the environmental or every government department is in its own little world. But in this case, the economic affairs minister and the social affairs and the environmental affairs and the maritime affairs, all four of them, four different government ministers collectively signed the first contract. It then meant that all of these government underlying government agencies, yeah, they the question was not, will you work with the sea rangers? The question was, what could sea rangers best do? And that led to a second or third conversation where you'd be in, in conversation with civil servants and then they'd suddenly go, oh, hold on a second, maybe, maybe there is something sea rangers could do. Have you thought of this or some of that? And then you just do the first work and it goes really well. And then there's another contract and all these little pilot contracts. And I think, yeah, there were initial results. And the more we worked in the program, and even some of our former sea rangers started working for the government agencies that they could recruit them in the jobs that they actually needed young talent for, then of course it's a yeah it's a win win. Mm-hmm. So our listeners love tips. Can you give us like because you got into a niche, right? You started off like was it what was it? Was it like the idea that was so good? Was the name that was so good? Was the government being small that was a, a good idea? Like top three things that like somebody getting into like the sort of super niche you found. 
how you yeah. get government contracts. I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting because when you say sea ranger, it, to most people, it's mm. like, oh, that's quite obvious. Like, you know, mm. I mean, it sounds logical that there are sea rangers, right? So the name, I think, has helped for sure. I think it's also a notion of you have to, it's just about seeing where there is a need or seeing that something can be done differently and really sticking with it. Like in our case, out of those 13 government contracts we've so far serviced, 11 of those is for work that has never been contracted outside of government before. It's literally the mm-hmm. first time that an outside party comes and, and assists what are essentially government enforcement agencies. That's, of course, quite a closed world. That's not something where they think, oh, you know, let, let's invite a group of people to come in and, and assist us. That's quite a closed aspect of government. So I think really sticking with, with your vision, and, and that's, of course, always a tricky one, because as much as you have to stick to your vision and, and really go with it, you also have to have a lot of people around you. You know, I, do, I don't, I don't want to have a lot of yaysayers around me that aren't critical. I want to have people critically looking at our model. Yeah, you also just have to really, I think, develop a vision on how it can be done differently and just really stick with it. So I think that's the other thing. We have some contracts. It took us four or five years to negotiate before we could start the mm-hmm. work. And if you're maybe a purely commercial entrepreneur, that's maybe probably not worth your while. But I'm an impact entrepreneur. I care about the impact. So I think whether it takes five months or five years, I don't, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, we just like we keep that. going. Yeah. yeah. Um, Did you yeah. coin that term or is it a real thing? Impact entrepreneur? Or is it just the new buzzword? What is it? <laughs> oh, I don't know. There's also two buzzwords. Uh, yeah. uh, you don't, you don't hear me going up to a stage in front of an audience saying, yeah. hello, I'm a disruptor or anything like that. But yeah, yeah. it's, uh, I always find that a bit funny, but it's, um, yeah. no. And I think what we also found is that when you are a social business compared to a nonprofit, a lot of partners are keen to support you and even support you in a pro bono way. So for example, we have PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, that actually made a lot of pro bono hours available because they said, you know, if we now really invest in you and giving you the, the knowledge and the expertise you need to really get this off the ground, then it's financially sustainable. So then you really can continue on your own. So there were a lot of partners like this who in the early years really made a lot of things possible that I think they would be less inclined to actually donate to a charity or a nonprofit directly or to a commercial company. It's almost like a very hybrid version where you sit in between the commerce and you sit between the purely nonprofit and you say, hey, actually, we bring these two worlds together. And a lot of people go for that. They see that as a sort of smart way to go forward. As you mentioned, you tell a story of progression and moving forward. But what have been some of the biggest challenges you faced in carrying out this mission? (laughs) Yeah, good question. There's a lot of moments where you know, you'd be like, this is just not possible. It seems like too big. I think what really helped is that I started this relatively soon after I'd lived on ships. So when I lived on a ship, you know, you just have your bunk, you get fed every day, and there's something to do, essentially, work-wise, right? That's living on a ship and just being part of a crew. So maybe as an entrepreneur as well, I never, I didn't sort of have a house or a whole family to maintain. And, and I could sort of rough it out as an entrepreneur for the first few years as well with very, very low costs. But there were really difficult times. And also when we had the first Sea Rangers, that didn't mean we already had the contracts. So we had to get the Sea Rangers, keep them motivated, pay them because they're fully employed by us. And that's been very difficult. So that's literally begging investors and, and keep returning and, and really trying to convince them to invest in this bigger vision. And that's maybe also, I would say, been part of the strength. We had a lot of sort of kind of smaller investors that we took along on the whole journey. So over a sort of four, five, six years, they've seen so much progress that they, these are people where they're committed for life, really. And, you know, we have an amazing investor community that have backed us. How did you find these? How did you find the smaller investors? Were they just friends and family? or Initially, friends and family. Then there is the Ashoka Network. Ashoka is this big network of social entrepreneurs. So we met some people through that. It's also just a case of speaking to as many people as you can. And maybe this was also something that, on the one hand, it's very difficult because you're talking ships Even though we're a social company, we still operate in a commercial capacity. So we operate sailing ships, but they have to still meet all the commercial maritime offshore industry requirements. And it's, of course, a very highly regulated industry. All our crew on board the ships, we don't have volunteers because they all need their seamen's books. They need their, you know, uh, basic safety training. They need to have medical certificates. It's, but at the same time, even though that's difficult, it's also a type of mission that really sparks people's imagination. So I think this notion that there is some young kid sitting somewhere in a rural area by the coast that looks out over that sea. And actually, we could mobilize that person and prepare them to better protect that environment. Yeah, it's just a powerful notion. So in Dutch, uh, we say lulle voor spulle means uh, <laughs> a lot of talking to, to get the goods. Uh, and that's just something you have to do as well. So I think initially with public speaking, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't so confident with it. And I had to really push myself out of the comfort zone. 
to just meet as many people as you can, talk to as many people. And for every nine that ultimately reject you, there's one that will believe in you. And the more you do that, the more chance you have, I think, at finding the right people to support you. Ahoy, investors. Are you on the lookout for a unique opportunity to invest in a thriving industry? Set your sights on ShipShape, the innovative platform connecting boat and yacht owners with top-notch marine service providers. Our team is committed to revolutionizing the marine repair and refit market in North America. But we can't sail these seas alone. With your support, we can enhance our platform and create a significant impact in the industry. Don't let this exciting investment opportunity drift away. Contact us today to learn more about joining our voyage. Reach out to us at info at shipshape.pro. Tell me more about your entrepreneurial style. Is it more like do you plan everything out, even five years out and stuff? Or are you, you know, just like, oh, let's see what happens and fly out the city of pants, but is it somewhere in between? What is it? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm quite methodical about it. <laughs> and I would say it's all about these unlikely partners. And it's about speaking to people's intrinsic motivation. So rather than me convincing someone that they have to help us protect the ocean, I speak to their intrinsic motivation, want to attract young talent for the sector, or because they might support maritime innovations, or because they want to support veterans, or because they're interested in innovation in shipbuilding. So these are all kind of, you could say, unrelated motivations. So it's been very much having a bit of a radar on. This is also something, uh, this quote of like, you know, try to learn something about everything and everything about something mm. is just to have broad interest and really see a bigger picture of, I think also, Meryl, as you put it, there's so many different elements to this marine sector and industry. And actually making the connections happen means that you can have very different people on board that typically wouldn't necessarily support you. Another aspect is always also been that, you know, when you go to an, into a government department and you're young people working on a boat, protecting nature, the last thing they expect is you to be like suited and booted as a proper, you know, almost looking like a corporate lawyer walking in, in. And that's what we've done. So we've always dressed and we've always presented ourselves in a really professional manner where people look at us and think, oh, that's not quite what I expected. <laughs> so we've always, yeah, but this is something that works because people then look mm. at you thinking, ah, oh, maybe the other preconceptions I had about this aren't true. And it's mm. just all, of course, these are all persuasion techniques. It, going into it slightly deeper, it's like people in, let's say, the US. People are, for example... You know, I was in the U.S. a few years back on the day that Trump got elected uh, mm. as president. I was there and sort of quite interesting as an observer seeing that whole fallout. It was in New York City, quite the place to be for that as well. But in the months after, I spoke to a number of friends in the U.S. and they were all like shocked by what was happening. And I'm thinking as well, like, well, if you want to really make change happen, why don't you work in the Midwest in some of these former mining communities and actually meet people and understand their needs and really do the work there, you know? If you really care about social change and you're progressive, why do you live in your little bubbles in the big cities and you know, mm, actually go mm. out there? And yep. so working in these rural communities, meeting people that have nothing with activism or environmental work and actually connecting with them and connecting with real people about what matters to them can still support your environmental mission. But you have to find a way to hook them and to get them on board and, and deliver on an impact that matters to them. So linking this kind of social element to the environmental work has been really fascinating in that sense to really it's totally broadened the kind of people we have on board, right down to the sea rangers that now also uh, apply for this work. Can you tell us what a day in the life of a sea ranger is? Sure. So it starts early. Working on a ship, there's always a lot to do. And while there may be days when you actually have to do a bunch of checks, have quick breakfast, and actually the ship, the ship will set sail early on, there are also days where sea rangers may initially start with exercises. So there is actually like a fitness regime that the sea rangers keep. There's also some physical requirements when you join. So they tend to also exercise in the ports where they are. And then during the day, there's actually typically a whole range of different assignments. So it can be that we monitor a certain area where you'd go out and you'd actually patrol before you come back into port. It may be that we use drones or underwater like ROVs to do surveying. We're now even preparing our ship to be more involved in hydrographic surveying. So that's actually having a mm. multi-beam echo sounder on the vessel. And, and for a sailing vessel to do that is, is quite unique. So, what, so, so what does you, that mean? You, you can take pictures under the water? Yeah, that essentially means you use sonar to actually make a 3D mapping of the seabed. So mm. typically this is for kind of in the commercial offshore sector, they use this to kind of map out the seabed before they do pipe laying or dredging. But also in terms of ocean restoration, often... Mapping the seabed is important to 
to see the state of, of that environment. And because it's a sailing ship, it's very hands-on. So sea rangers typically will be split every sort of week to have a different role, be it navigation, be it looking after the equipment on board, being the helmsman on board. But it's very hands-on. So it's setting the sails, going out. And some of the assignments, it might mean route for a number of days, up to 12 days at a time. So sea rangers work for two weeks full time on the ship. And then after two weeks, there is a shift change and another group of sea rangers comes in for two weeks. And then the, the others have two weeks off. Yeah, and that, that basically carries on throughout the year. Wow. And are they staying local or are they like traveling far away, thousands of miles away? How far are they going? Yeah, it's never thousands of miles because you are right. But I guess you mentioned earlier, Fala, is, is that it is also this element of what is the government responsible for? So what mm-hmm. is the work within a territorial area or within the economic exclusion zone, which is a little bit bigger. And that's the work that happens there. So I would say their most would be two, 250 miles offshore. And then we operate back into the ports. But that's a big enough sea area to <laughs> to keep busy. Yeah. Also in Europe, at least a lot of offshore wind development. So a lot of wind farms being built offshore. And that's also where some, you know, we're increasing, I think also will be involved in. I, I'm dying to know now, because you've already spent like five years going across the ocean yourself, et cetera, et cetera. What's like the, some of the craziest marine stories you can share with us? You know, just like, have you seen 50 foot waves? Like, what are you, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I, like, the best. Wow. Like, give us, give us one of each. The best. Well, there's many stories. Well, first of all, I should emphasize that whatever happens at sea stays at sea. But uh, <laughs> 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 no, so um, I remember one day we were in a, okay, let, a couple of days. So one day in Antarctica, we were, we were going through these really huge swells. And sometimes it can be nice. You're in your little bunk bed and you sort of hear the sea like rushing right against the, the bow of the vessel and you're sort of being pushed up by these waves. Uh, and I remember this rogue wave and it was literally, I think it was just five to eight. It was just before some of us had to get up for our shifts. I remember suddenly the vessel would just like, and this is, um, I think it's about 150 foot it's a vessel, big, like big, big, big patrol vessel. Yeah. yeah. But still you're in the Southern Ocean and, and the sea is, you know, relentless. And I remembered there was this moment where suddenly you could feel in your stomach, you could sort of, sort of feel it churning because suddenly we were brought right down very fast suddenly. And this rogue wave picked us up. We must have been airborne for a number of seconds because suddenly we were hanging up in the air and you could suddenly hear nothing. And then this vessel crashed down in this sort of thrust of this and everything was shaking and it was crazy. And everything, everyone was out of bed within like three seconds standing in the kind of the, the gangway, like everyone like, what's going on? And I remember another day where we're suddenly, we're out at sea. It's like the evening, we're ready to go to bed and suddenly this huge smoke starts appearing. And I was an engineer at the time. Yeah. And of course, one of the worst scenarios is that you have a, a big fire at sea. Engine fire, yeah. Engine fire and smoke everywhere. And we were running around and, and like, and I was running through the engine room, you know, you're opening doors just to check if there's a fire, but that's of course dangerous as well. And, yep. and we just couldn't find it. And finally, it turned out that basically one of the life rep, there's a little sort of smoke, like a flare and it had fallen on the deck and it had opened right next to a vent that sucks in the air. <laughs> so the whole vessel was on fire but actually that wasn't really the case and best like, case scenario though yeah, yeah. big relief yeah. big relief but yeah. those are kind of moments where you're thinking wow that seemed like a close call but false yeah. alarm yeah. maybe one more is we were in antarctica we had a few days of sort of downtime and this is in cape denison and this is an area where there is this big uh, colony of Adelie penguins, about 20,000 of them, really small little penguins. <laughs> this is uh, cool. on, on Antarctica, yeah. yeah. And we were nearby yeah. there, and there was, Mawson was this geologist who led an Antarctic expedition there, I believe in 1914, where from Australia, they went there and they set up an expedition hut. They had a vessel that went there. They even brought an aircraft there as well that was entirely snowed in. And for the first time, scientists would go there to excavate this this hut like a 100 years later, and they'd never been there since. So we were in the area and these other researchers would turn up and they basically, you know, we radioed through and we took a rib boat and we actually joined them and we helped them to actually, you know, hack away at the ice to <laughs> essentially get this hut exposed. So we're there, we're there working for sort of two and a half hours and suddenly this, you know, we reached the door. You have to imagine there was a big storm and this expedition crew had left and everything was just snowed under and frozen in because this is Antarctica. Mm. And it was like a time mm. capsule. So at the moment that this door opens, we step inside. And it's literally like there's like clothes hanging. There's like someone has basically throw the covers of the bed to get out of bed and everything is still left there. There are little notes written. There's like food. It's just there's a bit of I'm I'm really I'm not joking. There's a chopping board with a bit of seal meat with a bite taken out of it and a knife. 
left like in the kitchen and it's all frozen in and it's just incredible and, and we're, anyway it was beautiful and then i step mm. outside and literally sort of a couple of minutes later i suddenly hear huge like scream and jeering from inside and out come these two small boxes and it turns out that frank hurley which was the photographer that joined the shackleton expedition who made a lot of those really famous photos of those ships like stuck in the ice he joined Mawson on this expedition and out come for the first time out of this tiny little dark room in the corner come these two boxes with original glass negatives that we like hold up to the light and like this is like incredible so that's like goose pimple moment right you're just like mm, this. Mm, so mm. it's incredible yeah these experiences are uh, Dude, it's, it's amazing wow yeah the life the life of a sailor eh? yeah <laughs> yeah 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 well, good stuff okay so on our way out what would you like to leave our listeners with? I mean, you've, you've seen the world. You Again, you found your super niche. But one thing I want to throw in, though, is because like, you keep saying like environment and social and people don't see them together. I think they're literally the same thing. If people just became like more social, they would just automatically take care of the environment. You wouldn't even need the sea rangers, right? If everybody was just like more better about it. Okay? <laughs> if the pirates yeah. stopped pirating. yeah. Just what, what would you leave our listeners with? Yeah, I would say, I think increasingly there are real shortages of kind of people working in the actual industries we perceive as most polluting that actually are very much necessary to scale the various solutions we need to better protect our planet. So if you're thinking about the maritime industry, I don't see many sort of young climate kind of people <laughs> concerned thinking, oh, then I'll go and work in that industry because it's seen as traditional and old fashioned and, and polluting. And it's perhaps similar with aviation or the space sectors. Actually, People flying aircraft for all types of atmospheric climate research and for monitoring national parks and anti-poaching and such. We need actually pilots for that. Uh, there's a huge shortage. And similarly, increasingly, satellite data is really showing us where we can better restore and protect nature. So it's similar with seafarers. You know, I think we'll increasingly train sea rangers, end up working in the maritime industry, but we'll build really crucial capacity to better manage and, and ultimately restore the oceans. So what I would say is that, you know, if you know the young people in your own family or your own surroundings, or even if you are looking for some kind of career switch, really look at this kind of growing ocean economy and around marine kind of eco restoration or ocean restorative farming, like seaweed farming or kelp farming or all of these kind of sectors. They're growing so rapidly. They need investment, but they especially need passionate people to get involved. There's a lot, a lot of opportunity there. One of the last questions I have is, you know, where do you see the Sea Rangers going in the next 10 to 20 years? Yeah, so essentially we developed a model that is in that sense readily scalable, that these problems are really prevalent in many countries around the world. So there have been conversations with people in the US and in Canada. There have been conversations with people in Mozambique and South Africa who are saying, actually, you know, bring this model here. But instead of us bringing the model essentially got pro bono support from a number of partners to develop a franchising model. So we're mm. really looking for <laughs> we're looking for entrepreneurs, yeah, who essentially mm. are willing to yeah replicate and, and adopt and, and really implement this C range service model in their own region. So we increasingly have the resources to do that. We can support with training and also with the, with all types of investment opportunities. And that also means it's not just us sort of scaling with all these kind of national chapters. Actually, this is a story about bringing also the ownership of those solutions into the hands of the people that very much work and live in those regions where that impact needs to be made. So that, I think, is a fascinating journey. Our business isn't about this rapid scaling just for financial success. If we do this really properly, then over the next 15 to 20 years, you're going to see entrepreneurs in South Africa setting this up to work with the South African Navy to train South African youth to restore their environment. And we're going to see, see the same in, in the U.S. U.S. is a bit bigger. I can imagine maybe San Diego or maybe Baltimore or there are some of these former like, you know, very maritime focused areas where I think it would be great to make this sort of impact. So, yeah, you could say the next few years will be a big search for kind of the right people to join us on this journey and, and also be impact entrepreneurs to really make make that ocean impact a reality. Love awesome. It. So where can people find you, your LinkedIn, your website, wherever you want to share with them? Yeah, sure. Just go to searangers.org and then you'll find all the information there. Awesome, awesome man yeah great having you on the show thank you so much for being here awesome thank you with everything cool. yeah. check back every tuesday for our latest episode and be sure to like share and subscribe to shipshape.pro pro, 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 pro.